NHL 20 marks six installments since the franchise made the jump to the PS4 and Xbox One. And while the series is clearly better off now than it was when, say, NHL 15 launched on the consoles, it hasn't gone without its fair share of disappointments. The EASHL was rebuilt after being removed entirely, while the gameplay and overall presentation had become a stale experience for everyone involved as the years passed by. With NHL 20, EA is hoping that by sticking with the aging Ignite engine and improving upon the game's real-player motion technology that fans get a gameplay experience they can be proud of while making enough changes off the ice to keep players coming back months later. But is NHL 20 really the hockey game everyone's been wanting, or is it still stuck in the minors? Before getting into it, be sure to leave a like on this video and subscribe to Sports Gamers Online for more NHL 20 content. Whenever a new sports title comes out, players will hear things during marketing like new and improved gameplay, or in the case of NHL 20, gameplay fueled by RPM tech. While many will look at that and think it's just another marketing ploy to try and get the casual gamer to jump on board, doesn't appear to be the case with this year's game. I can honestly say that I haven't played an NHL game as enjoyable as NHL 20 from a gameplay perspective since the skill stick was first introduced back with NHL 07. From skating to shooting, things just feel more polished. Depending on your skater's positioning, you may find yourself either fluttering a shot to the net or going for a quick backhand. In pass games, you can get a bad position shot to come off the stick like you had just received a perfectly placed pass. That appears to be gone from NHL 20. That said, not everything is all sunshine and rainbows. There were times rather than go for the easier backhand shot, players would do a long spin and look for a forehand shot instead. Also, the backhands feel kind of overpowered at times, same with one-timers to the blocker side of the goaltenders. And it seems like the meta for scoring on breakaways is a simple forehand to backhand move in shot. Now with puck pickups, if a puck is around a player, they'll adjust accordingly to pick it up or battle with an opponent. There's still some minor hiccups every now and then, but the new improvements to the mechanic allow for a much smoother experience with breakout passes as well as general end-to-end -end gameplay. Also nice to see is the removing of the gliding when picking up a pass. Instead, players continue with their skating animations when receiving or going for a pass. My only gripe with passing is the speed at which passes come off the stick. No matter what your rating is, it can feel like you're trying to pass the puck along a section of blacktop rather than on ice. And on top of the passing speed with gameplay, it feels a bit too easy to lay players out with big checks at times, while pulling off deeks can be downright impossible even with some of the more highly rated players. For goaltending, you quickly see how the increased animations impact the play between the pipes. Quick animations like a shoulder shuffle or a quick move of the blocker make for fewer chances for soft goals. It's harder to score for the most part, and the rebounds are far more unique after shots. But that doesn't mean there aren't some ways to kind of take advantage of the situation. Despite all the improvements to the gameplay and goalie animations, there's still plenty of problems when playing against other players online. More specifically, there are too many instances of cheese goals, or what some may call glitch goals. From starting in the corner and then bursting across the front to easily beat the goaltender, to skating across in the slot from the goalie's glove to his blocker side, there's too much of a meta to playing online that still remains after years of the same complaints. If you don't take advantage of the exploits within the game, then your opponents online will. It makes playing ones, online versus, and even the AASHL pretty frustrating. There are even still some small bugs like the helmet glitch that allows you to remove your player's helmet if you give a visor to a caged helmet. It may not impact gameplay at all, but it's small things like that that have remained in the game for years that show a lack of attention to detail. One of the biggest issues from NHL 19 was the figure skating done in order to keep possession of the puck using a combination of left trigger and A or L2 and X. In the hours spent with NHL 20, it's clear that EA has nerfed that exploit in a major way this year. Now, it still works every now and then, but don't anticipate it being the problem that it became last year. That is, unless a tuner's release that reverts a lot of the good done during development. Defensively, it feels like you're on a near-level playing ground with offensive players, whether it be in a regular game or a solo-controlled mode like the EASHL. I didn't notice much in the way of Puck seemingly warping through a defenseman's stick, rather I was able to break up plays and eliminate offensive threats. Now, controlling the goaltender remains exactly the same as past years, but thanks to the additional goaltending animations, you cover the net in more ways, whether it be stick saves or pinching the puck near your shoulder blade. 
That said, it's still all about positioning. As long as you're square to the shooter, you're gonna make the save more often than not. Along with Ray Ferraro, I'm Shane Sabalski. Hi, everybody. Welcome to Washington, D.C. The crowd is hopping for this one. We'll send it down to ice level. Ray Ferraro between the benches. What are you seeing for tonight, Ray? One of the best new aspects of NHL 20 is the overhauled presentation. Gone is the NBC presentation, and in its place is an NHL 20-specific presentation that features new overlays, transitions, and a brand new commentary team. Doc Emmerich and Eddie Olchek are thankfully gone, making way for Vancouver sports host James Sabolski as the main play-by-play -play voice, with TSN's Ray Ferraro taking over on color commentary after being the third man on the team the past few years. Immediately, you notice there's actual motion in the cause of the action. Scoring a goal late in a game or to break a tie brings out an emotion from the call that I can't remember ever hearing in an NHL game. Quick feed to Backstrom. Hammers a shot. Scores! Just 20 seconds apart. That's a fair goal. You take a timeout here on the other side. There are fewer repeated lines thanks to the extra time spent in recording, but that doesn't mean they're gone entirely. But hey, it's a video game. Repeated lines are bound to happen eventually no matter how many hours are spent in the booth. The graphic presentation makes sure to highlight your players after goals and during the actions with stats like time on ice, shots, and saves. There's even a new score bug at the bottom of the screen that's drawn its fair share of criticism for being difficult to try and check out during the play because of its location and layout. Though I happen to like it, I do think that giving the player the option to have it sit at the top of the screen or the bottom could go a long way towards curbing that criticism. Graphically, the game's visuals remain pretty much exactly the same as they've been since the Ignite engine was introduced to the series back with NHL 15. Player likenesses remain subpar, the jerseys look off, and things have just become stale in the visual department. While I'm not one to bash the series for not jumping to the Frostbite engine because, well, you know about the issues with that engine in sports titles, it's time to really work towards moving the series to something new as we get ready for the next Xbox and PlayStation consoles. And finally on the presentation front, can we please do something about the overall navigation? Going through four, five, or six different slow loading menus in order to do something as small as changing beard length or choose a different stick is not something that players want to do. If you're a fan of the card collecting mode known as Hockey Ultimate Team, you won't find too much added to NHL 20. There's a new pack opening animation that you can thankfully skip as well as some new legendary players to collect. But the only new real mode update is the squad battles that come over from FIFA. These allow you to play against ultimate teams compiled by various members of the NHL community ranging from players to popular YouTubers in offline games for various rewards. The big head scratcher with the mode is that contracts still remain. Mutt got better when they dumped contracts, so it only would have made sense for Hut to do the same this year. This may surprise a lot of you, but NHL 20's franchise mode is the clear-cut best franchise mode in any of EA Sports' offerings. You can even go as far as saying that it only trails behind NBA 2K for the best franchise mode in sports games. But why is that? What makes it so good? For starters, nothing was removed from NHL 19's version of the mode. Instead, the mode saw a number of welcomed additions. The biggest addition comes in the form of the long-desired coaching carousel. Players have to manage eight coaches, four in the NHL and four in the AHL, that each bring different things to the table within your organization. Each coach has their own traits regarding scheme and player types needed, and this can impact players currently on a roster or potential free agents and trade targets. Speaking of trades, there's now even a trade finder within the mode, making it easier to make deals you want to improve or rebuild your roster. Still though, there's no fun elements surrounding the game's trade deadline within the mode, which just really comes and goes. I mean, just give us the cell phones back, damn it! Now the coaching carousel is great, but there is a problem with the system and it's that all the coaches you hire have to be free agents. You can't hire a coach that's employed by another organization, which means you can't hire Dallas's AHL coach to become Buffalo's new head coach. Also when you do hire a new coach, you need to rescout your target players to see if they'll fit in the new system. The morale system also returns with players and coaches coming to you for discussions on various topics, ranging from team performance to overall recommendations. The problem with this is that while you can view player morale at any time you want, you can't talk with your players or coaches until they come to you. Lastly, we don't see the league expand during your career like you may see in NBA 2K's franchise modes, meaning that if you don't choose expansion right off the bat, you're stuck with 31 teams in the NHL. 
Toronto's on the attack. Quick feed to Spezza. He scores! Well, not long now, for as great as NHL 20's franchise mode is, be a pro is just as bad. Actually, it's worse than bad. It's boring. And if you don't think that being boring is worse than bad, look at games like South Park for the N64 and Deadly Premonition. These were games that were downright terrible, but they weren't boring in the slightest. I mean, Deadly Premonition, a game that was panned by so many outlets, is still getting a sequel. Anyway, Be A Pro remains pretty much exactly the same as it has been since the series made the jump to the PS4 and Xbox One. Now, it won't knock everything because there have been some changes over the years, like that skills tree that gives a false sense of an RPG that so many games seem to stick in to basically slow your development, and coach feedback that helps you figure out what you do well or poor. But it's really been nothing more than that over the last five years. If there's any mode in the series that needs a complete overhaul, it's Be A Pro. I just hope that we don't get what we got back with NHL 14 when we got the deeper live the life mode in the last year of the previous generation, only for it to not make the jump to the next set of consoles. The online hub known as World of Chell returns in NHL 20 with quite a bit remaining the same. The popular EASHL sees no changes whatsoever, same with the uninteresting NHL Pro-Am. The other two modes within the world of Chell, NHL 1s and 3s, both see small improvements to add to the replayability factor of each. NHL 1s, which also gets a local NHL 1s Now mode that allows couch co-op, introduces a battle royal element of sorts in the forms of NHL 1s Eliminator. This pits 81 players in a single elimination tournament, requiring you to win four straight games to be crowned champion. The Eliminator mode was also added to NHL 3s, where you can join with friends or go it alone to earn unlocks for your creative player. Speaking of unlocks, they remain cosmetic only as your sticks, skates, and the like don't impact your ability on the ice. What does affect your ability is the player type you select, along with the various traits that remain the same from NHL 19. While custom attribute allocation doesn't appear to be destined for a comeback anytime soon, the player builds still feel a bit too restricting. If EA isn't going to re-implement the ability to build your player for the world of Chell exactly how you like, at least bring back a way to make them stand out more aside from the player traits. One thing that could be done is bringing back the ability for equipment to provide boosts to your attributes. Back in the earlier years of the ASHL, a player's stick curve would increase the wrist shot accuracy while reducing slap shot power. A certain skate could also increase agility or speed. Something, anything would help making players feel different on the ice without giving full attribute allocation back. Well, I guess that's that. That's that, and it's pretty clear, James, who had the upper hand. NHL 20 is a game that you'll either love or hate, and there's really no middle ground within this debate. The improvements to the gameplay and presentation make the on-ice experience the best it's been since the games of the late 2000s, while off the ice there's plenty to enjoy depending on what type of mode you prefer. Outside of some small emissions, franchise mode is as good as it gets, and HUT continues to be a solid mode for those into the collectible card game. On the other side of the coin though, Be A Pro isn't even worth one game, while modes like Pro-Am, Draft Champions, and Ones Now feel like wasted space. With the end of the current console generation fast approaching, one has to wonder where the NHL series goes from here, because there's no doubt there are still plenty of questions left to be answered. For more NHL 20 and sports gaming content daily, subscribe to Sports Gamers Online and turn on your notifications to be alerted whenever a new video goes live, and visit our website, sportsgamersonline.com.